Yeah, absolutely. They end up having to get rid of him because they're like guys come on in it's time to get started good to have everybody this evening we had a wonderful service this morning and a really just a wonderful fellowship this afternoon as well and uh, thanking God for uh, good friends and families and uh, thank the Lord for the Everson family uh, the blessing they are and had a really good time fellowship so thank God for that glad that you could make it back tonight God bless you and uh, tonight we got a special song leader for you uh, Darren is going to be leading for us, and his dad's going to play. So uh, they're going to handle the music for the rest of the week as well, leading the music and playing. So looking forward to that. And we will be taking up an offering in just a few minutes, so make sure you're ready for that. It'll be a love offering for Everson family. Okay, let's go ahead and let's do it. 587 in your hymnals. Please stand with me. 587. We'll sing all three. Sorry. I heard an old, old story. I was saved. 
Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love. me to victory beneath the cleansing flood on the last I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angel singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in Jesus my Savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere I knew him and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Wonderful singing. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Before we pray, I want you to turn your Bibles to Psalm 34 real quick, just to kind of set the tone for the evening. What a wonderful passage of Scripture. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. This is a psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. Did you notice those little words right before verse 1 are inspired as well? They are in the actual Hebrew text, and uh, those are inspired as well. A psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. And then neat, God gave us the commentary, the context of this exact passage of Scripture. Follow along with me. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me. He delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Hallelujah. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. You know, one thing that I think about when I hear Brother Everson and his family sing is that last verse. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. When I hear his music, it just helps me think about how great, how wonderful, and how good our God is. Amen. If you have not tasted that from the Lord, you will this week as you hear him sing and preach. And I encourage you to get some tapes as well. I have a number of those CDs. I say tapes. CDs back there. 
and uh, how wonderful they are to encourage you when you are needing some encouragement and want to enter into the presence of the Lord through music to taste and see that the Lord is good. Hallelujah. Well, let's pray and ask God to bless. Father, thank you for your goodness to us and how you have worked in our life in such a wonderful way. And God, this poor man cried. <laughs> That's who we are tonight. We are, we are poor men. We are poor women. We are, we are poor people. And we cry out to you, Lord, and we know that you will deliver us from our fears. You will give us the joy and the delight of our soul. Thank you for this time of refreshing, to hear the music, uh, the preaching. God, speak to our hearts tonight in a very special way, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Last song for the evening. Please stand with me and find 478. We'll sing one, two, and four. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught, All right, thank you. Great singing tonight. I love that song. Let's have our ushers come forward tonight, and we're going to take up the offering this evening. And again, remember that everything that comes in, loose plate, uh, is going right for the love offering for um, Brother Everson. And then also, if you have a check and you want to write out a check, Write it to the church, Cross Crown Baptist Church. In the memo section, put Love Offering Everson, and it'll all go right to them as well. Uh, that way we can have identify it and give you the tax thing at the end of the year if you want that. Or you can go by way of PayPal and do it online either way. So looking forward to that. So thank you all for being here, and we pray that you would um, just seek the face of the Lord. You know, this verse up here is one of my favorite verses you can take a look at it, Psalm 27, 8. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, 
will I seek? And let's seek the face of the Lord this week. Ask God to do a wonderful thing in our hearts, but also uh, let's give back to God how we've been blessed as well. All right? Justin, would you pray for us, please? And we'll take up the offering.
Since thou my portion, Lord, will be, I ask no more complete in thee. Yea, justify, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified I too shall be. has conquered reign within. Thy blood shall bid the tempter flee, and I shall stand complete in thee. Yea, just if I the blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought, thy blood hath pardoned, bought for me, and glorified Savior, when before thy bar all tribes and tongues assembled are, among the chosen I shall be at thy right hand, complete in thee. Yea, justified, O blessed thought, and sanctified salvation wrought, thy blood hath
of course. But uh, we're going to do a, a few numbers. Well, we'll have the whole night dedicated to uh, some gospel music. How about that? And uh, some, a little bit of toe tapping, all right? It's okay. It's all right. Uh, we'll, we'll have a little bit of that tomorrow night. We've got some special songs prepared for you uh, in that regard. And uh, I call gospel music, like gospel quartet music, which I love. Four guys and a piano. No offense, ladies. I wasn't a slam on ladies at all. But uh, I call it heaven music. Because the kind of most of them focus on songs about heaven. We've got some new songs for you uh, that we trust will be a blessing to you tomorrow night. The song I want to sing for you right now is one that I just wrote um, uh, for our latest album, and it's the title song. And there's some biblical thought behind it. I try to do that with all of our music, one way or another, even if it's a fun song. Um, uh, but I was thinking to myself, I occasionally struggle with a little bit of insomnia. It's not very often. I'd say maybe once a month, maybe even once every six weeks, maybe something like that. Where I just I kind of skip it, up. and uh, it's just like wow, I'm just up, you know. And uh, sometimes that can be due to to worrying about something. And maybe some of you can identify with me a little bit in that regard. We we do tend sometimes as humans to be worriers. You know, God's word talks about that. Uh, the psalmist calls it eating the bread of sorrow. Staying up late, eating, up, eating the bread of sorrow. Now, if you're a college student here and you've got to stay up late to do, a, to do a term paper or something like that, that's not really the bread of sorrow. It might feel like it. But uh, really, this is sorrow part, right? And in that same passage, she talks about God giving his beloved sleep. Amen. Sleep is a blessing, Amen. actually. And uh, in fact, Jesus took naps. When he needed them, that means it's not always a sin. Amen. 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 All right. Well, I get more amens out of that, but uh, uh, maybe you're sleeping now. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> in all seriousness, I, I thought, well, I want to write a song that has a little bit of a lullaby feel to it. But you try to find mine. I don't want it to be girly. All right? Because I'm going to be singing it. I don't want it to be girly. I want it to have a little bit of that lullaby feel, but at the same time have a strength. Because, you know the ultimate reason why we can sleep peacefully, even when there's trouble and difficulty around us? Because somebody else is staying awake. Amen. And that's him. That's God. That's the title of it. It's entitled God's Awake.
church looked out. Uh, is that, is that, did I, did I steal it Saturday the next Sunday? I don't think I did. Did I bring it back to you? Or I distinctly remember wrapping it up. Oh, you got it back there? I'm sorry about that. I, I should have, uh, I had this one on. And if you're wondering why, why you have the church, why you have the church lapel and your own lapel, this is an empty tree recorder. And uh, although you do a wonderful job with your live streaming, uh, we, uh, my son Brandon is recording the messages. And then we take this direct feed and we, we, uh, we mash them together. And then all the video quality mashes wherever we go. So you guys do a wonderful job uh, in what you're doing. But this way, the video will look the same uh, as the other videos, even though the background things might happen. All right. Why don't you stand with me for a moment? And we're going to pray and then we'll begin. Lord, I thank you so much for the truth of your word. I thank you that in its pages are found what you want us to know to live the Christian life. Certainly the Bible is not a collection of everything you know, but it's what you want us to know. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us in that respect, in that regard tonight. Thank you for these dear people who have come back this evening ready to hear from your word. We've already been encouraged today just by fellowshipping with people and uh, uh, just picking up a real like-mindedness here, Lord. I pray that you would help me tonight pray you'd fill me with your spirit. All is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. Of course, we know you're with us already, but that wonderful metaphor, Lord, of the Holy Spirit having his will, his way in our hearts. Help us tonight in the time we have. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Ephesians chapter number six. If you were with us this morning, uh, you know where we're headed. We're headed to the armor. The armor of God, of course, to recap just a little bit, to bring us up to speed. This is not something God does for you, but it's something you have to take unto yourself. Amen? We've got to, wherefore, take unto you. It's a choice that we have to make. Well, if it's a choice that we have to make, let's learn about what we're expected to do. Uh, this morning's message, I'm not going to re-preach, but I will bring up this one statement how serious are we about the battle? That is what we talked about this morning. Well, the serious soldier is going to be serious about his armor. And God did not leave us defenseless, amen? God did not leave us just to, uh, just to be torn apart by the wiles of the devil, uh, the evil one, and his forces. No, he gave us the armor. So let's look at it here tonight. Look at verse number 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. I call this the belt of truth. The belt of truth. Can we just stop for a moment and think about how important truth is? I think of one passage of Scripture that talks about truth being fallen in the street. I think of another passage of Scripture, I believe it's in Proverbs, that says, buy the truth and sell it not. What does that mean? It's possible to sell it. Are we seeing that today or what? People, for the love of money, twisting the truth. Guess what? When you twist the truth, it ain't the truth anymore. <laughs> right? That we're seeing that all around us. When he says the belt of truth, well, this is, this is uh, uh, a, a concern that each and every one of us ought to have. Now, when I've preached this passage before, I instantly jump to the application of living our lives in a truthful way. In other words, being truthful every man with his neighbor. Christians ought to be known as truthful people. There have been some times in my life where I would have rather done business with a non-Christian than a Christian, unfortunately. Maybe some of you can identify with that because, boy, they just used a little fish or whatever, you know, as a way to try to get more business. And then I felt like I'd been had worse off uh, than if I went to some secular business dealer who had better ethics, right? Business ethics. Right? And I say ethics. I know there's a difference between ethics, ethics and morals, but I'm not getting into that tonight, okay? 
But what I'm trying to say is usually that's exactly where I would go. And that is certainly true. And friends, tonight, I really believe that we ought to have a personal uh, attachment to truth in our own lives. One of the most terrible things that we see in Scripture is the concept of the Lord leaving someone to their own devices. You know, Romans chapter 1, right? God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them over. What about Pharaoh, right? Well, he so, said, well, God hardened his heart. You know, my, my Reformed theology friends love to talk about, well, God hardened his heart. Yeah, what did Pharaoh do first? Hardened his own heart over and over again. And finally, God said, you've had enough chances. That's it. What about um, in James where it talks about the fact that, uh, 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 but does, this man's uh, religion is vain, right? Uh, he looks into the perfect law of liberty, right? That whole passage there. One of the scariest parts of that passage is someone who's deceived himself. Self-deceived. Because those type of people are the hardest people to convince of something, right? Oh, I know the truth. I, I know it. I know it. What's your truth? Uh, are you tired of that? I'm so tired of that. Tell me your truth story. Truth story. What? What is that? What kind of double speak is that? Tell me your truth story and I'll tell you my truth story. Okay. Well, there's, a, there's one truth. Right here, the Word of God. Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Pilate was a, was a modernist, right? What is truth? It was standing, looking right back at him, was the truth. Thy word is truth. You know, we need to make this personal. We ought to be people of the truth. And, uh, and the difference that I'm preaching tonight is simply the idea of being a lover of the truth. It's not really a difference. It's just as I look around me, I see so many people who are deceived. And when we as Christians decide, I'm going to put on the belt of truth, it's going to be something that doesn't just affect us. Now, it affects us firstly because we've got to be honest with God. We've got to be honest with ourselves before the Lord. If there's something going on in our life that doesn't match up living an honest life, then we ought to take care of that. But I want to point out to you tonight that simply putting on the belt of truth is going to be an offense to some people. Because this world doesn't want to face an absolute truth. Because if there's an absolute truth, if there's a creator, if there is external truth that's not just based on feeling and whether or not I feel good today, or whether or not I feel like a, a man or a woman or, or purple or you know whatever it might be today, right? People are upside down and all over the place. If there's an external truth, well, then I'm going to be held to a standard. And man doesn't want that. So friend, when we put on the belt of truth, we have to understand this is a wholehearted commitment to the Word of God. This is a wholehearted uh, desire to be ruled by the Word of God. Of course, the belt of truth accomplished, the belt on a, on a Roman soldier accomplished a lot of things. One of the things it accomplished was uh, keeping the soldier's tunic, etc., and the various accoutrements that he would have uh, from... Uh, from entangling him as he was going into battle. You wouldn't want to go into battle and, and have your, your, your feet entangled with the tunic or the robe you were wearing. You wouldn't want to trip. You wouldn't want to have that, right? In fact, the idea in Scripture of girding up one's loins, I mean, we really don't talk like that, right? It's kind of funny now. Maybe I might say it. Gird up your loins, sons. We're going to do errands just because I want to be funny. All right, I might do that now. Uh, just because it's, it, we don't really talk like that. But it literally was, they would take, and maybe pastors explain this to you, if you're, or you've seen it doing your own Bible study. You can get some cool helps out there uh, that, that show you different things. But they would take that robe and they would tie it all around in a certain way so that their legs were free so that they could do battle, so they could run, so they could do whatever, to work, whatever they need to do. I think it's a wonderful word picture because the idea of telling lies is the idea of tripping oneself up. Okay, let's, let's just take a quick poll here. Poll question. How many of you have ever told a lie in your life? Don't tell one right now. All right, all right. 
I believe lies are like Lay's potato chips. It's hard to just have one. When I was in elementary, uh, I lied a lot. And I couldn't even really tell you why. It just became a way of life. In fact, uh, I can think of illustrations where I lied, I didn't have to, and I got myself in trouble for saying I did a bad thing when I actually didn't. Now that makes no sense, right? Did you do this bad thing? Yes. All right, well, you're in trouble, you know. Back in those days, you know, I got a swat. Maybe more than one. Da da da. Right? And I, and I lied into it. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. <laughs> but the most difficult thing about a lie is when you start having to tell the next one to cover all your bases. And then you've got to tell the third one. You, now we're getting deep. You, you're on to your third lie when different people know different version, you know, different levels. You're, you're dealing with some complicated stuff now. Right? It tangles us up. And listen, I know people, uh, I grew up with people, and you probably have too, that when deception becomes a way of life, it can actually ruin you physically. It takes a toll on your body to try to keep up with all these things, and then you don't know which way's up and which way's the truth. Listen, let's put on the belt of truth. Let's say, Lord, I want to be a person of the truth, even if the truth hurts. I'd rather uh, have, uh, I'm thinking of the proverb right now that uh, f- the kisses of the enemy are deceitful, right? Tell me something sweet, yeah, but it kills you in the end. I'd rather have the truth and sting from it than have someone tell me sweet things that aren't true to my own ruin. Let's put on the belt of truth. What else does he say? Having on the breastplate of righteousness. I call this the Kevlar vest. Of righteousness. I won't ask if there's anyone here that uh, has put on Kevlar and tried it out. I am not one of those people. I still do not understand how Kevlar works. I mean, I understand in theory, you know, the interweaving and all that type of stuff. And there are, I've been told that there's uh, ones that are better than Kevlar called dragon armor and this and that and the other thing. And, you know, it's, it's all incredible to me. But I can tell you this, it's armor designed to protect one of our most vital areas. Because listen, if you don't have a heart anymore, you're in trouble. Breastplate of righteousness. This is moral excellence. This is a, a love for what is holy and for what is pure and what is beautiful according to God. Righteousness. It, you can think of it as related to truth, but they're actually different things. You know, we live in a world where it is easy to lose sight of what is righteous. When I start thinking through in my mind, who could I think of as a righteous person in our society? Very few names come to my mind. It's because our society doesn't care for those who are righteous. Righteous. Our, our television, our movies, and by the way, I don't want to present myself, I don't want to be a hypocrite to you tonight. We do watch some movies and we do watch uh, some shows. We usually end up buying something on DVD set. We don't have to worry about uh, commercials because commercials are getting crazy. What in the world? I had people tell me, we, we saw, we saw a... Uh, uh, a homosexual commercial for a, a jewelry store on one of your music videos on YouTube. I just want to let you know, I don't choose the videos. I don't choose the advertisements that run on YouTube. All right, You see something terrible on there, I'm really sorry. It has brought me close to leaving the platform, actually. And probably will be a day when we'll leave the platform. It's not today. <laughs> But uh, probably will be a day when, we will, when we'll leave that platform. But, but having said that, we, we have, it's not going to happen by accident. Guarding our hearts is not going to happen by accident. We don't wake up in the morning and, and uh, just go about our day and automatically our hearts are going to be guarded. No, they have to be guarded all the time. 
Guard your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it are the issues of life. You see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If, if you see, the Bible compares the heart really to like that seed of man, right? That, that innermost us, our heart. How are you doing in protecting your heart? Are you getting up every day and putting on your Kevlar vest? Because I can tell you this, there's a target on you. There's a target on you. The devil's not going to take it easy. <laughs> can I, I'll let you in on how I think it works. This is my theory. Okay, this is my opinion. Ding, 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 ding. Opinion alert. I think we get escalated like a like customer support. You know what I mean by escalated? All right, so you have a problem, right? Oh, this thing won't work. My widget won't work. Whatever. You'll fill in the blank. Okay? Uh, 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 my phone won't work. Okay, let's just use that. So you call into customer service. If, they, if that first guy can't solve it, and you pretty much know, the guy's just going to be like, did you turn it off and back on? <laughs> like, yes, last week. Right? That's always the first thing. If that doesn't solve it, you get escalated to the next person who's supposed to be smarter and can help you more. Right, And if they can't help you, then it goes on from there. Based on what I see in Scripture... I, I don't believe that I'm important enough on the devil's list to be personally attacked by the devil all the time. The devil is not omnipresent. He is not God. He wants to be God, but he's not God. He can't be everywhere at once. So he's got his forces, and they are in a hierarchy, like a military type thing. And that's principalities and powers and all this stuff, okay? It's all organized that way. And so I, I want you to understand something. You might not think this is very encouraging, and it might not sound very encouraging, but when you win one spiritual battle, you get escalated to the next level. What does that mean? It's like playing a video game, right? You, okay, so you beat Mario World 1, or level 1, X3, right? What is that? It's three levels, I think. Neat, 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 right? I was terrible at Mario Brothers, okay? So uh, I never really went anywhere in it, okay? I could play the music from it, but, uh, right, you beat that level, and then you got to beat the boss at the end, you know? I remember, I grew up in the age of Nintendo and Super Nintendo. I mean, that's who I was. I did have some friends who had Atari. I mean, that was, that was it, man, the Atari. If any of you are selling an Atari, let me know. My, my, don't talk to my wife, talk to me. Um, <clears throat> but you get escalated, right? You, you, you move to the next level, and it's harder. It's same thing in school. You pass first grade. I'll never forget Miles. He was all excited about school when he was going to kindergarten, right? He was all excited about it. And uh, I'll never forget. I mean, she had the flag out. He did the Pledge of Allegiance and all that stuff. And at the end of that school day, he was very pleased because that was school. He thought school was done, like he was done with school, period. <laughs> No, you're going to, he did. He was convinced. Like, wow, that was okay. You know, I wouldn't choose to do that with my life. You can see his little kindergartner, his, his brain turning. You know, I'm glad I got that done with. Good experience. <laughs> and his mother had to tell him, no, you have school again tomorrow. I got to do that all again? And then say, actually, it's going to be the next eternity of your life. <laughs> and it's not going to stay easy when you pass something we reward you by making it harder <laughs> I could camp there for a long time I won't because just to let you know those of you who are young people still in school a test in school is one thing when you start having tests in real life the consequences are, are deeper sometimes there have been times when I wish maybe I was just in school because when I fail a test in school, hey, I kind of, you know, didn't have a whole lot of consequence. But to fail a test in life, it, it hurts. But having said all that, don't be discouraged. God says, put on the breastplate, put on that bullet, bulletproof vest, because the enemy's coming after you. So guard your heart. There are two primary gates to our hearts. 
right? We have five senses, but there's two primary gates to our hearts, our eyes and our ears. And if we will guard our eyes and our ears, we will go a long way towards making sure that our heart doesn't get damaged. When we're a human being, which I'm assuming most of you are most of the time, I work at that, all right? To have a heart attack can be a fatal thing. Spiritually speaking, it's the same thing. That's what our enemy wants to give us. He's coming after our hearts. Oh, friends, guard your hearts. Here is the prep, the preparing for those attacks. It doesn't have to surprise us. God's given us the tools right here. Look at verse 15. Let's speed up a little bit here. Do, 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 do. I like it. Verse 15. We're there. I like it. I'm going to throw this in extra, 30-second detour, okay? Uh, A new friend, I'll call him a new friend because we just uh, did meetings at his church. Brother David Shoemaker um, happens to be President Shoemaker's brother, uh, pastors of church in Taylor, South Carolina. And he was sharing with us, the first time we've, we've been there to his church, but he was sharing with us how he was preaching a funeral um, at uh, a church that uh, uh, was a black church. And he said uh, he went in and it said it was an incredible experience because there was a guy on the organ while he was preaching. And so he's like, open your Bibles. <laughs> We're going to turn to such and such a passage. <laughs> he said, Brother Ben, you need to check into that. You know, uh, I don't know about that, but um, I th- that's what I thought of. I-, I don't mean to embarrass whoever's phone that was or whatever, but I don't mind. Maybe, maybe we'll do that. I've got an idea. Bring, you know, that'd be kind of neat, right? <laughs> And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is this? Well, listen, when you're going to go somewhere, you put your shoes on, right? My kids, for a long time, and I can still do this to them, all right, now that I know that they're listening for it. But uh, when we lived in fifth-wheel trailers, basically for 15 years, give or take, um, they could feel the, the motion in the trailer when I was getting my shoes on. And they would scramble out of their room to put their shoes on because that meant daddy was going somewhere and there's probably food involved. <laughs> Am I, is this the truth? Yes, 100%. We're getting 100%. Yes. What? Just to go somewhere. Okay. I added the food part. Uh, we'll do that in 10 minutes here. We'll head over and have some fruit and stuff. Okay. Um, <laughs> where was I going? Oh, yes. Putting your, putting your shoes on. <laughs> putting your shoes on, right? It it means you're ready. You're ready to go. You're ready to act. You're ready to do. Listen, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Listen, you don't know when you might have an opportunity present itself to you to share the reason of the hope that lieth within you, right? That's why I was looking at your tract rack. You've got a good tract rack. You've got quite a, a variety of different tracts. I know not all of us feel comfortable just, well, I don't know how to witness to, I don't know how to, how to get people saved. Well, you don't have to get anyone saved. The Holy Spirit will do that. You just be a witness. You just tell others when you have opportunity what Christ has done for you. You know, that also means that you have to guard your testimony at, let's say, restaurants, Right? We have certain restaurants in certain cities in this country where the people know who we are because every time we do meetings there, there's one church that's brought us in 11 years in a row. This will be the first year. This was the first year that we've missed just because of scheduling conflicts. And let me tell you, that city, well, it also happens to be my hometown. So (laughs) it's the other good church across the street, across the town. Uh, So I guess there might be other reasons, but really we've, We've gone different places, and I think of a Chinese restaurant right now in northern Alabama, that uh, little hole-in-the-wall place. If we were to show up tomorrow and ask for food there and say, hey, we're ordering, they would say, oh, you're here from your travels. What have you been doing? They know who we are, right? The reason I say this is that we want to be ready always to give that tract, to give that, that message of hope. You never know when you might have an opportunity. I I remember one lady, a waitress, in Clarksville, Tennessee. And we were at, I think it was an Applebee's. And uh, she was our server. uh, But she was at the end of her shift. In fact, she had overstayed her shift. And we told her what we did. And that usually interests people. The only place it really doesn't interest people that we're singing family and we're, you know, respectful and are 
kids aren't screaming and yelling and fighting and all that type of stuff. Um, now, my wife and I, it's a different story. But <laughs> the kids are well-behaved, okay? The only place that doesn't impress anybody is Utah. <laughs> so we have to be specific when we're in Utah. You're finding out all kinds of stuff about us this, tonight. We, have, we tell people we're not LDS. And then they're like, okay, well... Who are you then? Because all the LDS, Latter-day Saints, right? We're not Mormon. But to get off of all these detours, what I'm coming around to is there's a lady in Tennessee in, in Clarksville, and uh, I will often ask, I don't do it all the time, I probably should, but I often ask, hey, is there anything we can pray for you about? It's a nice way to let them know you're spiritually minded and you care about them without being intrusive. So they, they can say, oh, you know, just for blessings of God, you know, you know, they're really not interested in going there. Other people really take it seriously and you find out some stuff, oh, my mom's on her deathbed, you know. Uh, this particular lady, boy, she was 24, 25, she'd taken her drug addicted brother in. She was a single mother trying to work several jobs and still had a smile on her face. And I said, wow, you're doing a lot. She said, I'm off my shift. Can I sit with you? She came and said, with us. We were able to talk about the Lord and, and uh, she was looking for a church. Well, <laughs> I can tell you there's a good local church we just had a meeting at. You're welcome to visit them. You never know what opportunities might present themselves, but if you're not ready, if you don't have your shoes on, there, there have been times, <laughs> never in a serious situation, because I know this is going out live stream and someone could report me, but never in a serious situation, but when I knew that it was safe to do so, Several, I think maybe each one of our kids at a different point in time missed out on a fun trip to Wendy's or something because they weren't ready on time. Is that not true? I think each one of you, so they know when daddy says it's time to go, it's serious because you might get left. Now, I wouldn't leave them, you know, well, I'm leaving you in Detroit. <laughs> Sorry. Walk home. You know, nothing crazy like that. All right. Uh, but, uh, but if you're not ready, you're not ready. Let's make sure we're ready. Let's keep going. We've got a couple more here. I love this. I love this. This is God giving us the armor, right? Get ready to share the gospel. Uh, we'll finish with the shield of faith. So let's go to verse 17. We've got the helmet and the sword, right? The helmet. What's the helmet? The helmet, it says the helmet of salvation. And, of course, the Word of God is accurate here. What I want to adjust is our understanding of this, of this phrase. Because it's not make, it's, he's not saying, you know, get saved every morning. Right? Oh, it's a new day. Oh, your salvation ran out last night at midnight. you got to get saved again. No. The, the hel- that would be putting on a head every morning. It's putting on the helmet, not your head. <laughs> okay? Some of us may feel sometimes like we're running around like a chicken with her head cut off, but you're, you're saved. You're that new creation. you got to put on your helmet, which protects your head. So I would describe this as that assurance, that confidence that you belong to the Lord. And you know, if you don't have that confidence, if you don't have that assurance uh, in your life, then, then consider why not. By the way, I am not the type of preacher uh, that tries every which way to get people to doubt their salvation so that we can manufacture some artificial numbers for people to get saved. All right, I'm not that way because I believe if you follow what God's Word says, then you're saved. If you'd like to, I'm not planning on preaching this message this week, but if you'd like to and you have questions about how do I know for sure I'm saved, like I I trusted Christ, but I've got these doubts and they keep creeping up. I've got a channel on Sermon Audio. You can link to it from our website. Please feel free to go and listen to that message because it's really straightforward. If you follow what God's Word says, you're saved. But what happens when we don't put on that helmet, maybe we've allowed other things to take up the place that Jesus is supposed to have, and so we don't feel that close fellowship. And so we want, man, am I really saved? Now, if you're not saved, well, I don't remember ever praying. My parents told me I did. Well, you know, I'd encourage you. You think the Lord is like, well, I'm not going to tell you. You know, <laughs> then, then trust Christ. I, I don't see there's anything wrong with that. My mom told me I trusted Christ when I was four. Uh, I never remembered that. So I was worried about that. I trusted Christ when I was nine. You know, you don't get penalized spiritually for that. It's not like God saying, I can't believe you didn't remember what you did when you were three and a half. I just can't remember. So he's not like that, right? So, so if that's something you wrestle with, you're gonna, you need to put on the helmet of salvation. 
um, in different times, in different ways. Our kids have asked questions. Our oldest, Miles, uh, he was in his late teens and, and mid-teens, I should say. Dad, how do I just keep doubting I'm saved? We went to the Word of God. I said, well, this is what it said. Did you do that? Yeah, that's exactly what I did. I said, well, then, according to the Word of God, what? Well, I'm saved. I said, yeah. I, I can tell you based on the authority of the Word of God, you're saved. You did that, you're saved. You did what God said, you're saved. Yay. He was like, yeah, I like that. Boom, we were done. It's okay. It's okay to be confident that you're saved. Right? That's putting on the helmet. And by the way, if you're, if you're constantly talking with the Lord, I'm kind of preaching the other message. I'm so sorry. I'm like, go watch the message. But if you're, if you're talking with the Lord, you're like, Father, ah, am I really part of the family? Do you, do you see kind of the, the irony in that? Dad, am I really... Am I really I really part of the family? Well, what are you calling me? Dad? Yeah. It's kind of like you got on the airplane and then and then and then you sit in the chair and you lift up your feet and you hold on real tight to try to help the plane fly. It's not gonna help the plane fly. Just trust the pilot. You got on the plane, you did what God's word said, put on the helmet, and then be confident in the fact that He'll never leave you or forsake you. There's so many Christians that are living and they're always going back to first base over and over and over and over and over again. They wonder why they're not going forward spiritually. Well, it's, I had to feel the right way. I, I didn't cry enough, whatever. That's not what it's based on. It's based on just doing what God's word says, which is trusting Christ. He paid it all for me. Lord, forgive me. I believe in what you did. You rose again. I believe you. Put on the shield, I mean the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. <laughs> I like this, right? We could preach a whole message on this. The sword of the spirit, right? Which is the word of God. This is our only offensive weapon, by the way. I know John Bunyan called all prayer an offensive weapon. And I, I think of that more of an, as an action rather than a weapon. But I mean, I guess it could be a weapon too. But I mean, here, we've got to know the word of God. I was in Las Vegas a couple Christmases. Well, it's been a few Christmases now. Um... And raising money for the ministry, brother. No, just kidding. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, we got stranded there, actually. We were on our way through and uh, had a clogged fuel injector on the truck. And so I couldn't go over 20 miles an hour. I'm skipping a lot of detail. I had to get around by way of taxi. Uber wasn't really a thing yet. And I had some interesting drivers. One guy was fresh over from Iran and announced to me that he did not care for Christians. He wanted to let me know that. I said, wow, that's interesting. I said, why not? He said, because you don't know your holy book. He told me that he never called it the Koran. He was clear that he was Muslim. He never called it the Koran. I can't remember exactly what he called it. But by the age of 10 or 11, he had memorized so much percent of their holy book. In fact, he went further than that, Pastor. He said, uh, you Christians uh, not only don't know your holy book, you keep retranslating it. So how can you possibly know what it says? Whoa. <laughs> like, ouch. It's hard to argue for a consistent word of God from a fluid text source. That's a whole other thing. All right? But it got me thinking, if I were to be thrown in prison and I couldn't have my cell phone, I couldn't have one of my many tools that I love, how much of the Bible would be in there with me? Right? It takes my favorite sword fighter that I've ever seen. Please don't be offended if this is not your thing. But he was a guy named Inigo Montoya. <laughs> Maybe a few of you know who I'm talking about. Right? And he had practiced all his life. Right? The Spaniard. Well, to get that good, any swords person, swordsman, swordswoman, I don't know, you have to practice. We're not just going to know the Word of God because you got saved. That, that by the way, is the weakness of uh, popular or uh, people in our culture who get saved and don't have grounding. 
Some of them, I believe, have gotten really saved. Some don't understand it. It's kind of a, a, just a publicity stunt. Others have gotten saved, but they're not grounded, so the answers they give don't make sense. But it's not because they're not genuinely saved. It's because they haven't had time to study swordplay, to study the Word of God. Let's study it. Let's know it. Let's end real quick here with this. Verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. What is this? Well, this idea, above all, uh, some commentaries think above all meant, you know, covering all. Uh, others, and, and I tend to think uh, uh, that it's above all kind of like Paul saying, hey, you don't forget this one. It's not that one is really more important than the other, but there is a sense in which the shield of faith will protect us uh, when we fail in a lot of other areas. What do I mean by that? Well, the Roman shield was not what we think of as a pizza pan. Right? What's the pizza pan? The gladiator shield, right? The, the circle on the arm. The Captain America, right? I thought I saw. Hey, there it is. All right. I knew I saw it. I was like, that's, why am I thinking about Captain America? It's because you're wearing it. Okay, that's a really good example. That shield, a lot of people, I'm holding up the shield of faith. Okay, that's not what Paul would have been referring to. The Roman shield uh, would have been, in fact, that word for shield sometimes can be translated the word do, for the word door. Because it's, it was big. In fact, if we could take, that's actually a little small there. It's a little narrow. Uh, shorten it a little bit and make it a little bit wider. You'd have about the size of a Roman shield. And what they would do is they would interlock those shields. We've seen it in some of those movies and history things, History Channel, whatever. The phalanxes, right, that the Romans would have. And they'd stick their spears through. It's like a big military porcupine coming after you. Right? Well, so... <laughs> the people they were fighting against thought, hi, we've got this figured out. We'll, 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 put, we'll, we'll send arrows, flaming arrows at them. So what the Romans would do is they would wrap their shields in strips of leather and they would dunk them in the horse trough, get them all wet. So when those flaming arrows would come at them, tss, right, it would help minimize the damage that was done. That's the picture given here. Wherewith he shall be able to quench that's why he uses the word quench. You ever wondered, what, why? where did the word quench come from? Why did he say quench? That's why. So if you think about it, let's put it all together here. We put on all the armor. We're getting ready to go into spiritual battle. Above all, take the shield of faith. What's the shield of faith? Listen, friends, if you only get one thing tonight, get this. Even when things get difficult, if you feel like you can't take another step, trust God anyway. The shield of faith is not salvation because we've already dealt with that. The shield of faith is literally the shield of trust. It's the shield of faith saying, yes, I believe. I'm taking God at his word. And you know what? Sometimes when I'm not as good with the sword as I need to be, <laughs> frankly, sometimes when I haven't put on that bulletproof vest of righteousness like I should, maybe I'm, I'm doubting God working in my life, you know, a lot of those weaknesses will be, will be helped by holding up the shield of faith. One of my favorite passages in all of Scripture is in the Psalms where God says, He knoweth our frame, He remembereth that we are but dust. Sometimes I get weak. But I'll tell you this, there's no armor for the back. There's no armor for running away from the battle. Sometimes if you can't go forward, what did Paul say? Withstand, stand, stand. Sometimes all you can do is just plant your feet, say, I don't know all the answers, but I do know this. Boom, I'm putting the shield down, and I'm going to stand here, and I'm going to trust God. And the darts and the arrows from the wicked one can fly at us, and we just let the Lord take those doubts, those despairing thoughts, and we say, Lord, I'm going to trust you anyway. How are you doing on the pieces of the armor? How are you doing tonight? I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed this evening. We've had a good time in the Word of God tonight. How about these pieces for you, friend? Is there one that perhaps sticks out to you as one that maybe you haven't been as vigilant as you should have been putting on? Listen, all these pieces are important. What about that belt of truth? What about that bulletproof vest of righteousness? Have you been guarding your eye gate, your ear gate? 
A lot of times we think of that as like, you know, bad music or something like that, but it's more than that. It could be ungodly counsel, wrong thinking. A lot of times through the eye gates, we think of, you know, pornography or things like that. It can also be what we read. What about those shoes, the gospel shoes, preparation of the gospel of peace? Are you ready to share Christ with others? And then the word of God. That helmet of salvation, friend, what about you? Then finally, the shield of faith. You need to just trust God. I don't know what it might be for you, but friend, pastor's going to come. We'll have a brief time of invitation. Let me encourage you. If the Lord's put his finger on one of these areas, would you deal with the Lord with that tonight? Dear Lord, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you that it has the power to transform us from the inside out. Lord, would you, would you help us? We want to put on the armor. Sometimes I know I forget. I'm too casual, even though I'm in a battle. Lord, help us to remember that it's serious, and we need to put on these pieces of the armor. Help us, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name. Pastor, you come. Amen. Let's all stand, shall we, with our eyes closed and our heads still bowed. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Tonight is an opportunity for us to taste and see the goodness of the Lord. And let's come and talk to God. There's so many things that the preacher talked about that could, we can deal with tonight. I know that God is faithful. He is speaking to our hearts. What was the area that God spoke to your heart about? Let's deal with that tonight, shall we? As the piano player plays, would you come on up and let's pray to do business with God tonight. Come on, guys. Good play. God spoke into your heart. Let's take a moment to pray. Seek the face of the Lord. The Lord said, seek ye my face. My heart said, I will seek your face, Lord. What's God speaking to your heart about? Remember, revival meetings like this is not always about salvation. It's not always about dealing with sin in our heart. It's also about drawing near to the Lord. Seeking the face of God and opening your heart. You can do that in the invitation as well, and I encourage you to do that. Seek the face of the Lord. Who else would come? One more stanza. Thank you for that song, Debbie. What, what, what number is that? Let's sing that, shall we, as we close. 577, Be Strong in the Lord. What a great song. 577, think about the words as we sing. Be encouraged, putting on the whole armor of God. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagles ascending. Victory is sure when you call on his name. Be 
strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for He is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is your... Look at verse 2. Let's sing that as it close. So put on the armor the Lord has provided, and place your defense in His unfailing care. Trust Him, for He will be with you in battle, lighting your path to avoid every snare. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and be of good courage, for He is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord, and rejoice, for the victory is yours. Be strong in the Lord. We do have a fellowship planned as well. Stick around and, and uh, go to the table, pick up some music, talk to the evangelist and his family, and look forward to having some fellowship with you. But uh, let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to bless him. By the way, Andy's here, brand new daddy, and uh, still got the, the pink ribbon on your hand, brother. Congratulations to you. Amen. And uh, did Sheridan make it, or is she... Wow, how about that? Had a baby on Friday, and here you are now, so amen. She should wear the Captain America shirt is what I'm thinking right there, brother. Yeah, okay. <laughs> amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, so much for the fellowship we've had tonight, not only around the Word and uh, the music, but we thank you for the Holy Spirit, for the sweet Spirit of God in our hearts. Thank you for the preacher and his realness with us tonight. And I thank you uh, for his candor, and thank you, Lord, that we can laugh, and we can cry, and we can be encouraged. It's been a good night. Lord, we want to be strong in you. Thank you for meeting with us. Bless now the fellowship, the food of our bodies. May you be honored and glorified. Bring us back tomorrow night, Lord. We look forward to being here again tomorrow. Pray that you bless. Bring some new folks, Lord. Help us to be able to reach out and bring some new folks with us that could be encouraged as much as we have been. And we'll thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody say 7 o'clock. That's tomorrow night. 7 o'clock tomorrow night. God bless you. You're dismissed. Oh, amen. Good. Amen. I'm glad that's a blessing. Oh, good. Yeah, um, it is kind of funny, though. About a third of your congregation went to sleep last night. No. No, I'm dead serious. I don't ever take that person. They were probably sitting right over there. Yes, yeah, and, and that's fine. I know that was I didn't mean that in a bad way. Every travel, I noticed something that, that when we were saying, within the first three months.